Thanks to Philip Samartzis for including me in this art enterprise workshop themed cultural context. Um, culture is often seen as a set of characteristic definition of a certain group, a group's uh, fixed identifier, but I prefer to see the reality that a culture is always changing, always growing. Uh, and in a lived culture, encounters are unavoidable and significant to these encounters are objects, which is the focus of, of my discussion today. Um, as an artist, I work with objects as interfaces, uh, but rather than calling them objects, I, I'd use the term things, because the term object implies a certain relationship with a subject, and this relationship uh, can be hierarchical as well. Whereas calling it a thing uh, implies more objectivity, interestingly. Uh, it implies that this thing, um, both abstract and concrete, can exist even in absence of a subject. Um, so these things that act as interfaces, I call them um, things in common. Uh, because they become something in common between different people or participants in this case, which could be different individuals, uh, different groups. Um, in a way, these things are the living link between and within changing cultures. Now, artists must be specialists of things because we work with things. We're even expected to cooperate with things when, um, when we express or narrate something. Um, I'm doing an artistic research on the enormous mosquito collection of the Smithsonian Institution, and people keep asking me, so what are you gonna make with the mosquitoes? What are you gonna, how are you gonna work with them? Uh, which is understandable because as artists, we work with things as though they are words in a sentence, or a paragraph in an essay, or even an essay in itself. Um, so as artists, we should um, deliberately develop this um, working relationship, this cooperation with things. Now, how do we do that? Well, today I will discuss how I've been working with different things as vehicles of connection. And as examples, I'll show three of my recent projects. Um, I'll start with my work, uh, Subtext after Kawara's title, 1965, made in 2019 in a residency in the US. It's a painting installation responding to a work by Ong Kawara, a Japanese American conceptual artist. In Subtext, um, Kawara's work is a thing I work with to connect a country's hidden history to world history. Um, so I cooperated with this thing as a link across country borders, but also across different histories. Uh, then I'll move on to the second work, Dos Cachuchas, um, two channel synchronized uh, dance video projections on translucent screens made in 2018 for a show in the Netherlands. Taking instances of this work, I'll explore how things are defined. Uh, what are things? Um, I'll explore the extent of things that links different identities, different histories, and also different times. The last example will be from um, Trade Trace Transit. Uh, a series of public intervention and a mobile ethnography of cardboard waste. This project started with a field work between 2014 to 2016 in Hong Kong, and then continued, although less intensively, until now. A part of the project, 855 kilograms of homes in another state, was shown at RMIT Gallery last year, curated by Helen Raymond with Tao Nguyen. So I'll discuss how I work with cardboard waste as a thing in common, which connects different spaces, but also link, um, links the past with the future. 
Um, I'll only discuss relevant parts of this project though, because I'm hoping um, this session will ultimately give some ideas for a methodology for cooperating with things in common, which could be helpful for our research practices. Okay, first word. Subtext after Kawara's title 1965 began last year when I first saw a lesser known work by Ong Kawara. I was in Washington DC for that mosquito research that I mentioned previously and um, heard about this show on American art and the Vietnam War, so I went. That's where I first saw this word, title. The title is that, title. Kawara made it in 1965. Um, and these are the curator's words in the catalog of the show, which pretty much summarize the impact of Kawara's work on me as well. Uh, when I experienced the materiality of this work, it captivated me. Maybe similar to its effect on Melissa Ho, um, the reason it did, however, might have been completely different. Design theorist Judy Atfield um, once wrote about what she calls wild things. Um, they're like the wild cards in a pack of cards, she said. Well, Kawara's work here was acting like a wild thing for Melissa Ho and me. It impacted us similarly, although because of different associations. My first reaction was awe. Uh, the materiality of the thing affected me. The size of the canvases, the color, and mainly the featured numbers 1965, which provoked a slight rage, which was immediately toned down by a calculated, calm reasoning. You see, um, I grew up having to repress emotions and thoughts connected to the year 1965 for a long time. So seeing this work was partly like having this history taken away from me. I thought Kawara must have known that 1965 was not just one thing. For most Americans though, 1965 might be one thing. It's the year the US started bombing Vietnam. Even if you haven't been born then, you might associate the year 1965 with the significant spread of worldwide protest against the American war in Vietnam. I, however, understand it quite differently. I wasn't born then, by, but um, I associate 1965 with my grandfather's disappearance. He was made to disappear. He didn't voluntarily disappear. He was disappeared during the mass killing led by General Suharto in Indonesia. My grandfather's disappearance was one of the most identity-forming family stories that my father had told me. I had to keep this identity a secret, though, because life in Indonesia would have been quite impossible if our family's connection to 1965 was known during Suharto. This is uh, one of the longest um, threads in my body of work, um, and this is why it has been the longest thread in my body of work. It has been about 1965 mass killings in Indonesia, and this is why Kawara's title affected me so deeply. Um, these killings are officially still unacknowledged until now. So compared to Vietnam, what happened in Indonesia was, is largely unknown. But um, to give you a figure, uh, the Nobel laureate Bertrand Russell said that in four months, five times as many people died in Indonesia as in Vietnam in 12 years. The American press knew about the US role in Indonesia, but chose not to share the information with the public. So while the protests against the Vietnam War went really strong, Indonesia was practically a hidden war zone. Whatever the US lost in Vietnam must have been won big time in Indonesia. Not long after I saw Kawara's title, I was invited to do a residency in the US again. This residency was in Davidson College, a private university in North Carolina. 
uh, the gallery would become our working spaces, an open studio, so there was an opportunity to engage with the audience in a longer time frame. So I chose to make this work a thing in common between me and my US audience. When I arrived and experienced the gallery in context, I realized I should convey process and distance by working spatially. Because 1965 was never just one thing, I decided to keep 1965 as a pivot point and practically exploded one thing into many canvases that travel across the gallery's walls, ceilings, and floor. Early in the residency, I planned the spatial composition and selected a bunch of canvases. I only realized at the end of the residency that I'd actually been working with a set of 65 canvases. I learned from Henning Weidemann's 1991 uh, photographs of Kawara's Today series that he would layer the monochromatic background several times before starting to work on the letterings. Um, art historian Jung Ah Wu, who did um, groundbreaking research on Kawara's work, translated how Kawara refers to the color in Japanese as shocking pink, which is, if you see the work, it's really far from shocking pink. He, um, well, she did convince me, though, that nothing was lost in her translation. Kawara really said shocking pink. Um, I also got other clues from Collart, the company that owns Liquidix brand, mentioned on the labels of Kawara's stretcher, ac according to Jay Kruger, conservator at National Gallery of Art in DC, where the work is collected. Based on all this information, I decided to um, experiment with Quina Creden Magenta. Three weeks of working more than 16 hours a day, painting 65 canvases large and small, and dealing with magenta in so many different shades was like encountering on Kawara. Magenta is a transparent pigment, so the first layer on the canvas was definitely shocking pink. Once I got to the fourth layer, though, I already could call it deep blood red. The layering from shocking pink into deep blood red is reflective of the history of this pigment, which, as a dye, was invented in 1859 and named after the most likely bloody Battle of Magenta in Italy. But this, interestingly, also links to the stories of 1965 Indonesia. One of my strongest mental image of the mass killings was from my father. He was a student in Jogja and tried to return home to Denpasar when hearing about the killings, anxious that his family would be impacted. He um, tried to borrow money from um, an uncle for the trip, but was met with an advice. Are you mad? Don't go home, stay where you are. The river in Surabaya is red with blood already. This is a typical story. Um, for another project, I also compiled personal stories from other survivors and often heard of similar imageries of rivers that were clogged with bodies and reeked of blood. This reminds me of Kawara's older works before he started doing conceptual works. In 1965, actually, he started. He, he was known for his gory figurative paintings before that, depicting scarred victims, as Jung Ah Woo described them. Kawara has reportedly said that the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings deeply impacted his personality. So, like me, Kawara had also been impacted, however indirectly and however differently, by global politics as led by the US. Now, has the color Queen Acrid and Magenta become a thing in common between the late artists on Kawara and me? But wait, is a color a thing? What is a thing? Well, some things apparently have a sort of metamorphic quality. They, they take form in different materialities. 
in subtext, I was working with things as technological artifacts, you know, canvases, paints, brushes, which were sometimes extensions of my body. Um, but in those kachuchas, I worked with my own body as a thing to embody a dance, which is also a thing, and inserted myself in the migration of this dance. Because of its migration history, the dance not only represents but embodies the complexity of identities, or like Stuart Hall describes it, the impossibility and necessity of identities. But what do I mean when I say the dance migrates through time? Well, this dance called La Cachucha came into and shook the West in the mid 19th century. It's an exoticized dance originally adapted and performed by the Austrian ballerina Fanny Elsler in Paris Opera in 1836, so almost two centuries ago. Please note this, the, the era of this dance's first performance, it's before the oldest found live motion recording, before the invention of motion picture technologies. Uh, La Cachucha was Elsner's translation of an exotic Spanish folk dance of Cuban origin during the wave of Espanolism in 1830s France. Spain was to France at the time half Asian, half African. This era was also when the con conception of the nation state and national identity and therefore othering emerged in the West. So within this era, Elsler's uh, translation of La Cachucha into the courtly balletticized form established her as a legendary ballerina of the Romantic period. Her distinctive dance characteristics were often referred to as pagan in contrast with what was considered to be the supreme Christian ballet dancing of the period. The dance brought Elsler to fame, touring across Europe and the Americas and roused many followers around the world. Her fiery performances and kachucha poses were immortalized by literary artists in the form of poems and essays, and by facial artists in the forms of lithographs and sculptural works. But her moves, the dance itself, was never recorded. There were simply no technological means to do it. Now, the first recording of the moves uh, was only done around half a century later, at the end of the 1880s. A dance notation theorist called Friedrich Albert Zorn had seen Elsler's performance in the 1830s and notated it half a century later from memory. Then, in 1967, more than a century after it was first performed, Laban notation expert Anne Hutchinson Guest reconstructed the dance by combining Zorn's notation with the literary text and inanimate facial documentation. Eventually, the dance was filmed almost two decades after this reconstruction in 1981. By this time, the original dancer Fanny Elsler had passed away for almost a century. And by then, the dance has been traveling, migrating for even longer across different bodies and embodiments in other forms and mediums, across different geographical regions, and through so many different acts of translations. The 90, 1981 revival of the dance on film was eventually digitized and uploaded on the Dance Notation Bureau's YouTube channel, where I encountered it in 2018. So, almost two centuries after Elsler's first performance of La Cachucha, I then brought the dance into my personal realm and translated this dance further into Balinese dance. This was such an intimate act, performing this translation with my Balinese dancing. Jeez, I have so much respect for dancers now. It's really challenging working with your own body, especially considering my complex relationship with my 
own impossible and necessary identity. I began dancing Balinese as early as I started to walk. So Balinese dance is a kind of a native language to But I grew up during the legal ban of Chinese immigration culture in Indonesia. Um, this was built on the legacy of Dutch colonialism, which categorized me as Chinese Indonesian. So on one hand, people would stereotype me on my so-called Chinese books, but at the same time, the culture that I was supposed to subscribe to was illegal. To avoid this othering, my Balinese dancing was handy as some kind of a proof of my assimilation. At the same time, though, I knew that it was never enough because the fact that I had to prove myself already means that I'm lacking. I staged my translation shot at the Indonesian Art Institute in Denpasar synchronized with the 1981 film of Royal Ballet's Margaret Barbieri, performing Hutchinson Guest, a 1967 reconstruction of La Cachucha. These two screens, Las Dos Cachuchas, are both translations, almost 40 years apart, but both embodying a dance, a thing that has been traveling through different materialities since almost two centuries ago. Things don't only travel in this metamorphic capacity along colossal timelines, though. They also migrate physically quite quickly, like the cardboard waste in my project Trade Trace Transit. Again, when I say that the cardboard waste migrate, what do I mean? Well, we tend to attach migration to the concept of the living. We say that some humans migrate because they want a better life. Birds migrate also to find a better life because as the seasons change, resources change as well. So the change in resources is a force that motivates the birds to migrate, just like the lack of better resources, a force that moves the humans. There are countless other forces behind lack of resources and seasonal change, including how our earth, a thing, revolves around the sun, another thing. So when I say the cardboard waste in this project migrates, I mean to also acknowledge the multitude of forces that cause the cardboard waste to move from hand to hand, from one vehicle to another vehicle, migrating from one node to the next node, and then we realize this is actually a segment of a magnificent trade route, the global cardboard recycling trade route. The segment of this trade route in Hong Kong is very significant, amongst other reasons because of this Occupy movement, which began in early 2000s. This node is where overseas Filipino workers gather hundreds, even thousands of them every weekend because they're mostly live-in mates who don't want to spend their only free day in their employer's homes, but hanging out in cafes would become too expensive too soon, so they take it to the streets. It's a significant note because they tell us a lot about overseas Filipino workers' life condition in Hong Kong, and it's also abundant in the migratory thing that I was following cardboard waste, which was, and this is important, repurposed to build day shelters. So I entered the route here and discovered that some Filipino workers groups have created a diversion of the trade route, increasing the nominal value of the cardboard quite remarkably by reselling repurposed cardboard waste. So the cardboard waste migrate in a much shorter timeline compared to that dance Lakachucha, and as they migrate across different worlds, they assume different functions, shapes, and values as well. 
I practically interned with my host in this cardboard cubicles community, learning their ways with the cardboards and also started working with the cardboards my own way as an artist. My drawings doubled as a way to make the cardboards traceable so I could keep following them in, on to the next nodes, the recycling collection point. Turning the bales into a big thick book with drawn covers. Where they compress them into bales with more structural pieces of cardboards on the outside. So the Filipino workers use more sturdy cardboards with their cubicles. So when I donate the things with my drawing spots, they get more of these in order to structure the bales. I also buy the machine for lift with their stacks to the floor where they would sell these bales and release my bales to the end of the bag or, or the starting point of the river Hitching a ride with host truck to the port, I get to know Kyung, a forklift virtuoso who supervises paper waste storage at Takli Logistics plot at the port until the bales are ready to be shipped or trucked to paper mills like Billionaire Chang Yin's Nine Dragons Paper in China. So these cardboard bales will be delivered to recycling facilities in China where they'll be remade into new cardboard boxes some to export Chinese goods around the world and the cycle continues. Anyway, I was known amongst these recycling workers as the woman who did the drawings on this cardboard waste that eventually arrived um, at their hands um, and they sometimes commented on my drawings too. Um, meanwhile, my interaction with my different host groups with different characteristics caused my drawings to evolve into narratives. Um, as my knowledge about the, the root grew, I started inscribing my field notes onto the cardboard waste. So its functions shifted again. Uh, they, become, they became mediums for the field notes that I published or made public. At the same time, they became more legible and became a thing in common, a link. Uh, when I drew this, for example, my host asked where this was and what happened there. Uh, she had never been to the port. Her, her time and movement as a domestic worker is limited. Um, uh, and the same thing happened here as well. Uh, the workers noticed when I began drawing the route, uh, this route that's so familiar to them. So they were intrigued when they encountered an unknown part. Who are these women, they ask. What do they do with the boxes? This world, they've never seen this world before. Now, when I explained to my host that the very cardboard we were sitting on would eventually get to the port, to this ship, her first question was, how much do they sell the cardboard at the port? So I don't think she reads Arjun Apadurai's The Social Life of Things. But she understood that when a thing enters a different world, it also enters a different regime of value. Closer to the end of my field work in 2016, I worked with the recycling collection points to intercept the, the bales that then made up my installation, five tons of homes and other understories. So instead of letting these 16 bales go to the port, the truck diverted them to Art Basel, Hong Kong, which is on the way to the port. I showed these bales at a curated section of large-scale insula installations whose 
curator Alexi Glass also gave a talk in this workshop a few weeks ago, as Phil in, in, informed me. Um, uh, in this art fair, the Bales entered yet a different world, and hence another regime of value. While previously their value was dictated by the global recycling industry and all their own power structure, in this world they're valued differently. Uh, I remember when I first started drawing, my host asked to keep some of my drawings. They'll keep me warm in my room, she said. I learned when she said warm, she wasn't talking about temperature. She was actually talking about meanings and memories. It's a different kind of value system. So at the end of the show in 2016, I decided not to let these veils dissolve into the global waste trade route. I kept them. As an accumulation of meanings, the veils have become an archive of this significant segment of the trade route. This archiving was timely because Less than a year later, China began a crackdown for waste import with National Sword 2017, a short campaign that grew um, to become the country's ever-growing waste import ban, somewhat a show of China's power upon the global waste trade route. Meanwhile, Hong Kong is now at a crossroads. As an archive, the bales that I kept will also eventually link Hong Kong's past with its future. So um, to conclude, earlier we've established that culture is alive. Culture is always connected to how people live. It comprises behaviors and habits of individuals. It's lived and cultivated. Um, you can see how the Latin roots of these two words, culture and cultivated, are connected. If a culture settles, it ceases being a culture. Within this living culture, as an artist, I see things as potential things in common, and this interfacing should be my most important side of involvement in culture. I've talked about different things and their, their nature in these three recent projects, what they are, how they metamorphose and migrate, while facilitating different encounters, li linking between different spaces and times between the past and the future. I've also shown my material research, by which I mean uh, both research about the material as well as research through the material to identify things um, potential to be interfaces and cooperate with them so they become things in common. My methods were contextual, they were always contingent on the things and their social circumstances, and in working with them, I become an integral part of these circumstances. So, here we are. I hope um, this discussion can now be an integral part of your circumstances and can spark further reflections.